The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code RGAME to get yourself 10% off. Yeah, absolutely. I've been using those uh, that Torpy Bamboo for the last couple of weeks and I'm telling you, I need every bit of help I can get, Michael, and uh, to stand into me. You'd be disappointed if you were the keeper that conceded that goal from John Connell. looked like he was going to be there, Ferenc, but obviously there was an extra little whip to the bamboo and he couldn't stop it. <laughs> hey, I wonder will he be back doing it this year? He was, he was obviously back training with Clare towards the tail end of last year going into that quarterfinal against Waterford, but didn't appear. But if he could hit the ground running this year, that'd be something else. Yeah, I saw a picture of him uh, running on a running track with Colm Galvin and a few other Clare lads. It was in one of the Clare play- papers. Uh, either the champion or the people, uh, and he looked in. He looked in good nick. So, listen, he'd be a massive boost for Clare. They uh, they probably need just a couple, a bit more of an impetus, a bit more focus away from Tony Kelly. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. That's one of many subplots heading into this weekend and heading into the next while. There's so many. It's amazing when you haven't seen it for so long. There's so much uh, information to be refreshed upon, and I suppose we'll, we'll do our best to refresh people before it kicks off. Yeah, I mean, we're in May now. The weather has been, like anyone who watched the Champions League semi-finals this week, the weather was cat. So we don't know what we're going to get this weekend. All of a sudden, it could turn on us and be great weather. But um, huge round of fixtures coming up. And we are operating in the dark to some degree. We're going to speculate like we always do. And we try and give a, a somewhat educated or at least researched guess on what's going to happen. But the one point you made was that there's a lot of old friends uh, facing each other this weekend. God, there is, yeah. Like, um, David Lennon obviously won uh, an All-Ireland with, with Galway in 2017, was part of, the, part of the kind of extended panel. He's coming up against Galway this weekend, making his, probably making his debut for Westmead. Uh, a big kind of move for him too. Uh, probably would have thought he had a couple more years left with, with Galway. Shane O'Neill came in and he was uh, probably cast aside without, without you know putting too fine a point on it. So he's he's uh, he's involved at Westmead now. Uh, Noel Larkin, who was involved with Galway when, when they won the All-Ireland in 2017 as coach, is coach under uh, Shane O'Brien. So that was probably part of the link there. Uh, but be interesting to see what he can do. Like It's a fair... Um, their baptism fire coming up against your own again, and and I know like Davy's a a bit of a character and will be well liked among the pa- among the panel. So that's an interesting one. There's plenty of other little bits and pieces there as well, though. O- uh, Owen Larkin is involved with Wicklow as coach, but he's also a manager of Ballon Killen in Carlo. And lo and behold, uh, Carlo and Wicklow meet this weekend. So Owen Larkin's in a position where he's obviously worked with Wicklow for the last couple of weeks as coach. He's going, to, uh, he's going to be involved in a Wicklow team coming up against some of the Ballon Killen lads. He's never met the Ballon Killen lads, even though he's their manager. Uh, and just with, with Wicklow and Carlo in particular, uh, the, the likelihood or chances of it being somewhat feisty are probably more likely than maybe with some other counties. Uh, given their proximity and given their probably uh, their checkered history uh, without being disingenuous to anyone involved in the two counties. So that's going to be an interesting one. And obviously you have Niall Corkin who was coach with Leash under Eddie Brennan for the last couple of years and made great strides in Leash. He's now down with Davy, and of course, lo and behold, who are they, play- who are they facing in the first match? Uh, they're play- facing Leash. So it's Wexford against Leash there. Niall Corkin going back against his old team. But I always love it. I always think it's interesting. Uh, I always think it's interesting when you're facing off against your own uh, your own side or side that you were with previously. Did you um, did you play against Carlo during your spell with Wicklow? I did. Uh, the only time I played a brief couple of minutes, a Christy Ring semi-final in Carlo in 2017. Yeah, I came on for the last few minutes. Don't know how I only came on, but you're listening. That's a... That's a man. That's a man. It's a disgrace, is what it is. Let's let's just I, call it out. I should have went public. I should have went public about it and done an opinion piece or something like that. But should listen. There's no point crying over now at this stage. But uh, yeah, Carlo were on the rise uh, when we played them. 
so they won the ring that year they won the mcdonough the year after and that was when they were really flying under bonner they'll probably drop back a bit now tom malali's in for his first year so it's going to be interesting to see even how they progress uh, there's so many different things going on so many different stories within counties and within divisions uh, and it's just great to have it back and it's only right that when GA comes back, that the first weekend is all hurling. Give everybody exactly what they want. Do you know what Darren Gleeson, who's the Antrim manager, he was a bit unsure about this. So, you know, the hurling counties were canvassed. Do you want to come back that week early to footballers? Obviously, you have four weeks of collective training. It means a longer league for the hurling, more games. But maybe the risk of injury is that much more. So... I, I think there's a fair chance that in a few weeks' time we're going to see lads dropping like flies and the likes of Limerick have a massive panel, Tipperary have a fairly big panel. Teams like that probably will end up with some sort of an advantage even though that's completely not the idea behind the way they've structured this. Yeah, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you. Uh, Liam Sheedy was talking this week as well about the fine balance of getting boys back into the inter-county environment but also, and getting them back up to speed, but also them not picking up injuries and I know you've been in that position as well and I've definitely there where you're trying to get uh, a certain level of training in the bank but you just have to be so careful that you don't fall over the other side of the cliff you you can be on a cliff edge there between yeah getting loads done um feeling the benefits of that in a few weeks time just pushing yourself too far all of a sudden there's a calf a calf strain a hamstring strain and you're chasing your tail for three or four weeks if you pick up a knock you know, hamstring tear, first, second round of the league, you're under pressure for championship big time. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. They're coming in with no challenge games. I'm sure they've tried to play internal games, but you can't you can't just go and play a 15 aside the first night back or even the second night back for an hour. It's not that simple. Uh, there's a lot of complications, and I think uh, good S&C coaches will really earn their crust at this moment in time. The, the managers and the SC coaches that are able to keep people on the pitch. At the end of the day, that is an SNC coach's job to get make sure the best players are fit and on the pitch and fit for selection. And so, no doubt he'll be fighting with his manager half the time about saying, give that player another week. And the manager will be like, well, look, my scalp is on the line here. Uh, see, it's a tough one. Give that play, give that player another week and make sure that he's 100% ready to go or risk him now and pick up a knock and then you're without that player completely. I always think it's better to have the player even if at, not at fully fit and not fully tilted. It's always better to have the option. If you don't have the option, you have nothing. Mm, absolutely. Now, we, you and I both suspect there's going to be a bit of pandemonium this weekend. There was clarification from the GEA yesterday, Donald Smith... Uh, who's involved in the rules committee, he was clarifying some of the rules. It does feel like there's going to be a little bit of pandemonium here. I'll just, I'll just bring it up on screen. So a lot of it will be to do with denying a goal scoring opportunity. And everyone knows inside the D now, um, if there's a cynical foul, there is going to be a penalty. You were, you were at that discussion yesterday, Michael. What, um, as far as you're concerned, what was the, the highlights of, the, of that discussion? Uh, I, I don't know about highlights, but I mean, immediately what came into my mind as a, a somewhat cynical defender would be that if I if I pull a jersey back, it's not you know it's not going to be deemed uh, a cynical offence in that nature. It's not going to give away a penalty, or you're not going to be sin binned. So I'd be worried that there's going to be a lot of players pulling jerseys back. They're not going to be diving on lads maybe as much. It's not going to be as obvious. But if you pull a jersey back, you're only getting a ticken and it's only a free, unless it's inside the large parallelogram, which was the old penalty area. So like I just wonder are we are we just rife for like this becoming like really, really common in the game? Like you you do and like regardless of, you know, sportsmanship or et sporting ethics or anything like that, you'll do what you have to do within the rules so if you're going to only get a ticket and you're not going to give away a penalty like managers are going to be saying just pull them back don't drag them down just pull them back and i'm worried i'm worried that we're going to see a lot of that this weekend uh we john milan on the throwing yesterday and he just said i thought this was this was really interesting because he's involved in camogie and i think it's it's just interesting what he said he said there's one gray area with the new rule you can tug the jersey and pull it back but it's not it's not a black card Liam Sheedy said that you'll have to defend smarter and we all know defensive coaches are going to be schooling lads 
And this is going to be happening. Regardless, people aren't going to say, oh, we were working on that in training. But it is, it is going to happen. Uh, they'll be saying, if he breaks the line, you're allowed to pull the jersey back. You don't have to pull him down. You can pull the jersey back. What's to say if I broke past the defender, they're not going to pull me down. They're not going to wrestle me. They're not going to wrestle me to the ground. But it's quite easy to pull the jersey back. And he said he's been involved with De La Salle, Camogie, and he was on about Beck Carton, who'd obviously be one of Watford's best players and one of De La Salle's best players. She just said, the girls that she's coming up against, they're schooled. She breaks the line and they just tug the jersey back. And it's not a penalty or a yellow, yellow card. And almost, I can do the first pullback. You can do the second pullback. You can almost, you know, we can almost mm-hmm. share the offences. And that that is a worry. I just wonder, Saturday evening and Sunday evening, is this what is, we're going to predominantly be talking about? And was that a goal-scoring opportunity? Was it in the area? I, I just think we've made, I think we've made a problem for ourselves when there was no need. Uh, maybe just extend the, the penalty area for one, uh, forget the sin bin for the moment. Just see, would the deterrent of a penalty been awarded it within a larger area? Would that be enough of a deterrent? I think we've hit the nuclear button uh, a bit too soon. Now, fa- saying that, it's been piloted for, for the 2021 inter-county uh, league and championship. But it's not, not so. going to be... Yeah, not, not going to be in the club championship. But to the best of my knowledge, anyway, mm. it's not going to be in the club championship from all information I've, be, I've been given. And I know... Which is like, good news for you and I. <laughs> um, we're coming towards the the twilight, but this like, it's like when Dermot O'Sullivan. It's like yeah, it's like when the, the helmet came in and it, it retired Dermot O'Sullivan from from County Harlan. I don't want the sin bin or you know the cynical fouling rule to have to retire either of us. Even though people would say we probably should be retired at this stage anyway. Yeah, well, like as as I was saying all last year, and I'm sure you were too. The idea of um, picking a specific line uh, around the 21 and the D and thinking that players that will stop all cynical fouling. It's just not going to work. People are going to pull further out. And now, like you're saying, with the just tug the jersey back and that can that can be your n- new cynical foul. Is it going to change things in the last minute? You know, like we, even in football, there's obviously a lot of rules clarified as well. But, you know, we were talking beforehand about Cormac Costello spoiling that kick out for from David Clark of Mayo a couple of years ago. Like in Hurland, quick puck outs are now going to be stopped as well. You know, if it's at the other end of the... You need a goal with like a minute to go. You're going to have cynical fouls in other parts of the field. Teams are going to know, don't do it inside the D and beyond, you know. It's just going to move a different way. And even one of the rule that's coming in about the, the puck out that you mentioned beforehand, that looks like that's rife to be abused as well. Yeah, no, I think it does. Uh, basically, if if someone interferes with a, with a puck out or it's interfering with a free or anything like that as well, if you're interfering or trying to basically, um, how should we say, trying to upset or put the other person off, uh, it would be moved up 13 metres. But like, if I'm a goalkeeper, just say I'm... You know, I'm Nicky Quaid. I have the ball in hand. It's a puck out. And there's someone standing in front of me and they won't let me take the puck out. Now that's going to be moved up 30 metres and it's going to be a free. So in my head, I'm thinking that's actually an advantage to the perpetrator. So if we do that, Limerick are looking for to win possession with two minutes to go. I do this. All of a sudden, Nicky Quaid has to take, you know, a free from the 21 yard line. That's no longer an advantage to Limerick. Like, that's not an advantage. He has to settle himself. And then it's obviously more difficult to pull someone out or pick someone out taking a free than it is just straight out of your hand. If he could sprint out to the 21 and puck where he likes straight out of his hands, I'd be all for it. But I think these, they're, they're, they're half measure rules, which means there's always a way to exploit them. And that's the thing that frustrates me. I think, Shane, as well, uh, they've, they've said, obviously, they're open to you know being tweaked or whatever and i think there will be obvious tweaks i think that i think i think we're flagging up the tweaks that are probably going to have to be made uh if they're gonna fall on a kind of a happy balance yeah okay well we'll start jumping into the games this weekend and westmead against galway you've already mentioned that um david glenn is going to be against his former charges now i did a preview with david connors of the tomb hurled about Galway's entire season so check that out if you like but i i just don't feel that galway are too far away i think they should probably win this game with a little bit in hand but I suppose we are operating in the dark we don't know exactly what players are going to be out there this weekend but you'd imagine considering I, th- I would imagine that Shane O'Neill and most other managers they're going to want to play their first team as early as they can as quick as they can unless they're playing against somebody who they know they've drawn in the championship I think there'll be a bit of shadow boxing there but otherwise I think you want to play your first team straight away or get as close as possible then you want to arrest some of those players then play them again, rest them a little bit, play them again. 
because obviously you can't play them every single week and then hope that they're all going to last uh, in the summertime. So I'd say we'll see not too far off Galway's best team or what's available. I th- yeah, I think the vast majority are going to have to go with what they think is... like Their starting 15 uh, at the weekend is not going to be probably what the starting 15 for championship. There might be one or two changes, but you're going to have to go with what you think is going to be your 15. There's not... You know, there's very little room for any you know interpretation or any... Uh, tinkering or anything like that you can't like start half a team one week and start half a team another week and then hope to blend the 15 by the end of the league they'll have to have a fair idea something obviously this is um this is realistically with due respects to west me this is galway's easiest game uh this is probably a chance for them i would say to ease themselves in group 1a is much more difficult than group 1b so in 1a you're basically there to be shot at. If you try to experiment, you could be in trouble. You could take a 10 or 15 point beating. You could be chasing your tail. Like Galway, for example, Galway footballers last year took an absolute pacing from Mayo in the first league game back and were just struggled to get build any sort of momentum after. Whereas I think if you're in Group 1B with, with Clare, Wexford, Dublin, Kilkenny uh, as the big hitters, I think you can experiment a bit more. There's less of a... There's less of a risk of taking a morale sap and beating. But uh, from from Westmead's point of view, gonna gonna be tough. They, they beat Carlo to stay up in what in uh, Division One last year. It's gonna be a tough assignment. They're coming up against the big, big hitters. Well, like if you just go through the teams that Westmead have to play in Division One One A, as you've mentioned there, Westmead are gonna have to play Cork, Tipperary, Galway, Watford, Limerick. Now the other side in Group B, it's Clare, Wexford, Kilkenny, Dublin, Leash, Antrim, and they probably would have felt that they're gonna get a couple of more results if they're, if they're in the other side. So that's a tough one. And even if you look at Westmead's run last year in the Joe McDonough Cup, which is obviously the form that we can most recently go off. They were beaten heavily by Antrim, 425 to 115. Beaten soundly enough by Kerry, 219 to 14. They had a narrow enough win over Meath by four points. And then they beat Carlo as well, which is not to be sniffed at. That's a good result as well. I, it's going to be a, t- a tough ask for Shane O'Brien to have his players... Obviously, they're going to be pumped up for every game. But to have them feel like they can they can beat some of these big teams or keep it into them. like It's only a couple of years ago since Cork put 140 up on them into the championship. Now, I know that's different, but it's just going to be a tough ask for Westmead. Uh, it is going to be a tough ask. Like, realistically, and again, with due, with due respect to them, just the sides they're coming up against mm. are the, the real, real big hitters. Like, what's Westmead's most important league game? And I, I don't again. I don't mean to be disrespectful. It's the relegation match to try and stay up in Division One when they play the bottom team from One B. Um, you know the results from from last year's Joe McDonough, as you listed out there, just wouldn't be that encouraging. Again, they haven't had a load of field time to work on things. Again, look as a weaker county, you need more time. You need to bed in. You need to find new players. I think. I think. It, the way the championship league and championship works out this year, particularly with with the way COVID has affected it, definitely affects the weaker counties. Like Limerick, know exactly where they are. Limerick know exactly where they are. Introduce a couple of new faces. They have a right good squad. They know exactly where they are. They know exactly what they do. Westmead don't really. You know what I mean? And there's a couple of other weaker counties like that. Uh, counties that are trying to make the breakthrough. I just think the gap, the gap to try and get there gets bigger as a result of circumstances in the world at the moment and the fact that they're only back training together since April 19th. How do you make that up? You know, how do you bridge that gap? I think, I think if anything, the gap gets bigger between, you know, the big hitters and the guys maybe lower down the table. And I wonder what, what players Shane O'Neill is going to give a chance to. Jack Canning is back in the squad. Maybe he will get a go. He's a big, big man and obviously a brilliant striker, but he was away for a spell. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets um, if he gets an opportunity. Connor Walsh of Turlock Moore. He's a player who stood out, looked in really good physical shape when we were watching him in the Galway Championship last year. Maybe he'll get a go. There's a couple of other young lads, maybe Darren Morrissey, cornerback. He might get a shot as well. But um, do you feel that there are many players away? I just felt watching the game last year against Limerick in the All Ireland semi final. Col Mannion going off injured early was a big blow, but that there were just one or two positions away need to probably move away from the sweeper and just get a bit more athleticism in the forward line around Joe Canning, who will obviously start. Yeah, they're obviously pushed Limerick very close. I, you never felt they were going to win the game, 
but they, but they were there, they were there or thereabouts. Does that suggest then they could have lost heavily if they were never really looking like winning it? It could have gone badly against them too, because no, Aaron, Gal- yeah, Aaron Galan wasn't right. He, he just didn't seem right in that game. I think there was a bit of fear on Limerick's uh, shoulders as well, beaten in the semi-final by Kilkenny the year before. They were just looking for the line and looking to get over the line and do whatever they had to do. But just going down through some of the Gala players last year, you know, Shane Cooney got his first real year at inter-county level, uh, struggled at various stages, but I'm sure we'll learn an awful lot. Sean Loftus probably the same. Brian, Can- Brian Concanon, having been good in 2019 in what was a bad year for Galway, was brilliant last year. Yeah. Thought he was... Thought he was all star material last year, to be honest with you. Uh, based on the games he played, I thought he was outstanding. There's a couple of guys that you could expect. You could expect even more Finton from Burke. this year. Finton Burke as well. Yeah, obviously had the had the crucial in the club final a couple of years ago. Uh, was kind of came on in the semi final last year at wing back and was very very good, having having only come on early in the game. So there's a lot of guys that you could expect a good bit of improvement from. All the older brigade stayed on board. Uh, even David Burke, who had a tough year last year uh, with injuries and everything, and a really tough day against Limerick, they're all still on board. You'd imagine uh, the likes of Canning, David Burke, or Old McInerney, Aidan Hart still on board as well. They're all absolutely mad to give it one last shove, and they do physically. They do have a lot of the raw materials to to put up put it up to Limerick. I'd expect the game plan to evolve a bit. Uh, I I just the sweeper kept them in the game. Uh, but I don't know if it was ever going to win them the game. I'd expect things to evolve a bit more this year, but uh, they definitely have a lot of the raw materials. To, mm. They're one of the few. They're one of the few that you could see taken down Limerick. I'd agree with that, and I think Evan Nyland is another guy who can bring in there, because you would have thought with his size, is he going to struggle to make an impact? But any time I saw him come in, he made an impact. He was good, and he's good on the freeze, so I'd have no fears about throwing somebody, somebody like him in there as well. Um, we'll move on to Limerick against Tipperary and just a reminder we're brought to you by Torpy and uh, go to torpy.ie and if you put in the promo code our game you'll get 10% off the bamboo stick which is well worth getting a great old strike I'd say Torpy and the boys are all out the door at the moment I'd say there's some amount of boys ready to get hurls and have an order I'd say they're absolutely out the door and it's great that uh, anticipation of getting your hurls it's almost like it's like it's, it's just the new season is here. You get new ash or you get new new bamboo and you're ready to go. It's, there's nothing like it. But I would have thought for you, a leg of a chair would do. You're only going to go out and flake off a lad anyway. I, I, my hurley maker back home here, I collected a couple of hurls. Uh, it could be two years ago. I collected, I'd say, three new hurls. And he said, ah, these will surely see you home. And in fairness, I haven't been out there. I haven't been, I haven't been out there to get any new ones since. When you're when you're silky and skillful, Shane, you tend not to break as many hurls. You know what I mean. You tend to just be very, you know, very cute on the ball. So Limerick against Tipperary this weekend. I think this is a big one for Tipperary. Like last year, people had had already talked about how Tipperary hadn't beaten Limerick to win the All Ireland Championship, haven't lost heavily in the uh, Munster final in 2019, and even a couple of times before that, Tipperary. We're up against it against Limerick in the championship. Now, obviously, there was the the dead rubber game in 2019, but I think no one's really going to count that monster win for Tipperary as being a big deal. But last year in the league, start of the year, Tipperary were seven or eight points ahead in Thurless. It was like a Saturday evening game. Ten, and, I think, yeah. Ten. Yeah, it was probably even ten, yeah. And continued to bring on young lads and young lads, which obviously you do need to do, and there's always a balance with these things, so everyone understands that, and a league, a league victory isn't a massive thing. But... From the bench, I think it was Willow Donoghue, Keane Lynch. Basically, Limerick were bringing on All-Stars and they turned around the game and they won the game eventually. And it's not that big of a deal, of course, but the, the problem is, psychologically, you don't want to get your team used to losing to a rival. So Tipperary had that for a number of years against Kilkenny after winning the All-Ireland in 2010. And then it becomes a bit of a psychological gap and people say, oh, Tipperary haven't beaten Kilkenny in nine games and 10 games and 11 games, whatever it might be. So I think from this point of view, Despite what Liam Sheedy said this week on Tip FM of, I don't think there can be any bad result for us on Saturday night, I as a Tipperary person would be saying, there is. If you lose heavily, there certainly is. And I think any win you can get against this Limerick team is important at the moment. 100%. 100%. There's definitely there's definitely a lot of potentially bad results if it, if it ends up like the championship game last year where Limerick just absolutely kind of coast away from them or the Munster final the year before. Then, as I said earlier, that's a morale-sapping defeat. 
and you're ch- you're chasing yourself, you're chasing to get back to form. Um, and lads are almost thinking, Jesus, if Limerick are beating us going half speed here, uh, you know, we're a nice bit off the pace. So I d- definitely think, I uh, definitely think, um, Lim- Tip need to show something at the weekend. And what you said about last year's league match, yeah, you can say it was only a league game or whatever, but that all is goes into your psychological bank almost. Sure, like we played Limerick in the first game of the year last year, we were up by ten points, and we and we still couldn't beat them. They have the the hoodoo over us. They just seem to be, uh, they just seem to be tips kind of kryptonite at the moment. And as we talked about in the preview show, looking at Tipperary season, going to be really really interesting to see what way Sheedy kind of marries the youth and the experience. Uh, Shami Callanan's obviously out. He's got that ongoing back injury. He's going to miss the first couple of league games. So there's a big focal point of your attack on. But it's just going to be interesting to see, you know, what role does Paddy Maher play? What role does Noel McGrath play? What role does John McGrath play? Uh, Brendan Matter as well. Just, it's going to be really, really interesting to see. Does Sheedy look at, I don't know, do you almost look at, do I, they're playing Limerick Saturday night. Do I need to be looking at my team for the year, at how I'm going to beat Limerick, how I'm going to beat the Standard Bears, how I'm going to get a really, really mobile unit that are going to be able to match up against them? I, and I think that's nearly what you need to do if that's what your aspirations are. Um, and then obviously you can pick horses for courses, maybe playing against some other teams. But he's going to have to find that balance. I think mobility is the key word. When we went down through the options that Tip had, there is a lot of mobility there. It's just a matter. It's just a matter of kind of mixing that with the experience as well and putting key guys in key positions as well. But it's going to be real interesting. And I think, like I think. Like Tip or like if Limerick are beating a couple of points at the weekend, I don't think that's much skin off their nose. If Tip are beating, you know, five or six points and don't show that much, I it's I don't think it's a great sign for the year going forward. Well put it this way, if you're um a Tipperary player who's 20, 21, 22, that area, so like probably some players we didn't mention in the full tip season preview would be like say Dylan Quirk, who looked really good against Watford at the very start of last year. I think he scored four points from play and he got man of the match. Brian O'Mara is probably somebody that people haven't heard about. <clears throat> He's an option. Then there's um, the Killadangan man, Billy Seymour, a goal scorer in that All-Ireland under-20 run a couple of years ago. These are lads that mightn't be too far off it, but we don't really know what shape they're going to be coming into the new season. They could have spent three, four months eating weights in the gym. We don't know. And obviously, it's a great opportunity for players to make a huge physical jump because normally if you're trying to do all that gym work, S&C work, to get up to the next level, you have to marry it with playing games at the same time, so it's a bit of a, a balancing act. That won't be the case this time. <clears throat> but the challenge for Liam Sheedy is, he would let's say he wants to use some of these players, and you know Paddy Cadell and maybe Owen Connolly, who impressed with the under-20s last year. If he wants to start throwing a few more of these players out, he, Limerick will be able to peak for the summer, so they can still continue to train hard at the moment, and you feel like they'll at least perform pretty well in games, even if they're not at full tilt. But if you're a young player for Tipperary, you kind of nearly need to be at full tilt for this game now. So you almost need to peak now to get the confidence that you can do it against Limerick, but then maintain it the whole way through the summer. And like Tipperary need these players to actually go out and hit the ground running now to make them feel like we've got massive options for the summer because Tipperary, are, are, they're probably better off... If you're going to lose this summer, you're better off losing with the younger players rather than persevering with players that are probably only have a year or so left. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting one. And from an underage kind of player's point of view, someone that's coming through 2021, it is a different, it's a really different dynamic the last two inter-county seasons. Uh, I, I'd imagine uh, some players' kind of uh, growth and development would be halted a, a small bit. Just the lack of contact time. You see a lot of guys going in at 21 or 22 into a county setup, and they can develop something shocking with the coaching that's involved. Uh but that's not kind of the scenario this year. And I'd say that's going to be the really interesting thing. How does Sheedy introduce a couple of players? We can't introduce too many either and take too big of a risk. Like, for example, the, the tip team that started the, the game against Limerick last year in the semi-final, like I, I, they didn't start, to me, they didn't start a team to beat Limerick. Like We, we previewed that game in the week leading up to it. And you were give, you were giving Tip a decent shot. You see the team, and you're kind of thinking, "Boo, Dan McCormick and a few others not on the bench." So it's just going to be interesting how he's going to introduce these fresh faces while not giving them too much too soon. 
and while ke- still keeping a strong team. So it's going to be really, really interesting. Mm. I think it's back to the, the Friday nights or the Thursday nights of, you know, taking a lot of stock in what the teams that are announced are like. And it'll be, Jesus, right, he's starting, he's not starting or whatever. And it's a, there will be, you'll almost get like a statement of intent from the teams that are named. So it's yeah. going to be really interesting. Like fitness is obviously a big part of this too. So we could name names and we don't, I mean, it's so hard to get information at the moment. You know, would Mark Kyo, who started the Munster semi-final against Limerick last year, didn't go his way. Will he feel like I'm going to throw him in again and give him a right chance and, and see how that goes this time? We, we just don't know. So we are very much operating in the dark at the moment. And next week we'll probably feel like we know a nice bit more about it. But definitely, I don't think there's you can really go along the lines of there's no bad result for Tipperary here. There certainly is. You just you don't want to bring in that negativity. And I know like they're, they're, like if you jump back to 2014, which is a long time ago now, but Tipperary had a disastrous league. I think they conceded 12 goals in, f- in three games at one stage. But then actually, sorry, they had a disastrous run in the league, still got to the league final, pushed Kilkenny close and took the All-Ireland to a replay. So maybe you can have a couple of bad league games. And maybe irrespective of how these games go, Liam Sheedy is right to just throw those players in there. Because, do you know what? Experience is experience. And find me a player out there who hasn't lost the game heavily at one stage, Brian Fenton being the obvious example or the exception. But you know what? So what if you lose a game heavily? Just throw them out there and let them learn from it. Maybe that's the thing too, because you won't ever get used to Limerick's intensity without being thrown out there and then kind of go through the experience and then realise what do I need to do before the next match, physically, mentally, whatever. M- maybe you just have to learn the hard way. Fair point. The only thing I'll say is in other, in previous league campaigns, there was always that time, you know, it was yeah. February, March, April, May, then you're coming into championship. There's a, there's a time, there's very little time and you know as well as anybody, this is a kind of results-based industry. It's all about results, even in league. Uh, you, I, I, I would go as far as saying you know teams that are going to go really well in championship will have good solid leagues they'll get they'll get plenty of good results behind them i don't see like someone losing three or four games in the league and being able to turn it around massively in championship just because it's such a short time frame there's a very little you know, gap or a very small window to improve so that's going to be interesting from limerick's point of view like you know they're probably going to start 12 of the all ireland winning team and that's the luxury and you know you could you could name out there's probably going to be two to three lads Will, will will get a chance and they obviously have Mike Casey coming back don't think he'll feature in the league but could feature in the next maybe you know six weeks six to eight weeks Richie English didn't feature last year with the cruciate that he did last February but he's going to be fit and raring to go now as well you have the likes of you know the likes of David Reedy and a couple of others who have been there or thereabouts Peter Casey will be trying to nail down a start in 15 I don't see too many new names Carl O'Neill is one uh, who who will come in and might get might get a shot, might get a couple of chances. He's still doing his leaving cert though, um, and he's you know, probably going to be given a bit more time to develop. Limerick are probably afforded that luxury too. They can probably give players a bit more time to develop uh, into a senior hurler maybe than Tip can at the moment. That's the luxury of being champions, and that's the luxury of knowing nearly exactly what your fifteen or your twenty six is before you go out. Yeah, so the final game then in Group 1A is Cork against Waterford. And jumping back to last year, when you roundly dismissed Cork, as a lot of people did from winning a winter All-Ireland, I think everything that people had said about Cork was confirmed in that Munster Championship game against Waterford, who completely ran them off the road for a finish in that game. I think they won it by seven points. So if, if Kieran Kingston is ever going to be able to wind his team up and motivate them for a game, this should be it. Like he's changed some of the panel. We know Anthony Nash is retired. Aidan Walsh has been dropped. So has Conor Lahan. So he, he's sort of moved on, feels like fresh faces, all this kind of stuff. Maybe players like Shane Barrett will see being introduced. Maybe some of the other under 20s that it, like Alan Connolly. You know, we, we'll wait and see who's introduced. But they still have a great cohort of players. Pat Horgan, obviously, Shane Kingston, Dara Fitzgibbon. There is quality all over the field. Do you feel that they need to lay down a marker in this game? Yeah, I think they need to I think they need to show something, Shane. Yeah, they're going to have to. Um, as I said, like we would have said before, maybe uh, Cork aren't a great league team at that time of the year. The normal, you know, winter, spring season, heavy sod, wet ball, or whatever. Like league and championship should be absolutely perfect for them this year. There should be absolutely no excuses. Uh, you'd imagine there's a, a bit of a, a bit between their teeth, uh, particularly coming up against Waterford this weekend because. 
they showed very little against Waterford last year. I was while they were beaten by Tipperary in that qualifier uh, on that awful day down the Gaelic grounds. Uh, and you could say Tipperary uh, poked it away and should have been further ahead at different stages. I thought at least there was a. I thought there was a bit more heart and a bit more fight shown from Cork. So I'd imagine Kieran Kingston will be trying to work off that template going forward. We'll try and we know what they can do with ball in hand. I think he'll be working nearly solely on what are they doing when ball is not in hand. How robust are they in the tackle, particularly as forwards? As forwards are can shoot the lights out. I'd be ha- I'd be as happy if. Shane Kingston and Pat Horgan only got a couple of points from play each if they were, you know, battering rams for defenders coming out, if they were holding up guys and making it much easier for the guys at the other end of the pitch. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, Donald Grady been in there as a coach and selector is going to be interesting as well. Um, obviously, probably out of the inter-county game a good while uh, since he was since he won that Munster title with Limerick in uh, 2013, I think it was. So or that was John Allen actually. He was involved. He was involved with Limerick after being involved with Cork. But it's just going to be interesting to see what he brings to the table there as well. Uh, would be seen uh, as one of the most influential figures within Cork Hurling and obviously a previous All Ireland winner manager. So interesting to see what he brings there. Kingston has done in the second year what I thought he'd do in the first year with the cull of players and fresh faces introduced. It's just a matter of uh, getting that steel into Cork. To be honest with you, if they have that steeliness, um, they would be hard beaten because we know that we know they have the hurling, but. Yeah, it's gonna to have to. We're gonna to have to. I'm gonna to have to see it. You're gonna. I'm gonna to have to see it now before before I believe it. And it's gonna, based on what we saw against Watford last year, um, they should have a massive point to prove this weekend. Is it a lack of steel, or is it management and successive management not understanding the type of players they have and to develop and developing a system for them? You know, for years we saw teams trying to copy Kilkenny and play that you know, direct sort of a game. When they were winning All-Ireland after All-Ireland and you could puck it up to TJ Reid, Henry Shefflin, Owen Larkin and so on and so forth and they just win the ball and score. And at times Tipperary, for example, just went long ball. And you don't have the same type of players, so it didn't work. They had to find a different way of doing it, which was the crisscross, the, you know, the interchanging of play, the flowing movement, all that kind of stuff. Do Cork just simply need to find a different style of play? Uh, pot- potentially so you need to it's, I suppose good management good coaches will find a style of play that suits the players they have available to them at this moment in time um, there's one thing when you, you see some managers coming in some managers that play the sweeper system shall we say and they play the sweeper system regardless of the team that they're with and you're just thinking like this doesn't suit every well, every Galway system. Well, Galway an example he, of that, and like Shane O'Neill always impressed me with Napierschik, so I was a little surprised he did that. And I mean, look, if I was in there, maybe I'd make a, a hames of it myself. And he got his team closer to Limerick than anybody, so maybe he's fully justified. But to me, that would be an example of it. Yeah, no, a fair point because they're a big, they're a big, robust, physical team. You'd imagine that a more direct style would suit them, and the, like Cork. Probably not a big physical robust team, so they need to they need to open space. They need to create space. They need to place a massive value on possession. The one thing I will say is it's just is without the ball. That is what I'm saying. I just think they need to be whether it's a, whether it's a swarm defence, whether it's getting two or three lads around them and with the ball. They do need to make it a lot more difficult. When when Watford were in possession against them last year in that Munster semi final, they were absolutely going to town on them, and there was not there was just wasn't guys near enough uh, to the attacking player, and the tackles that were going in just weren't robust enough at all. Uh, I know Don O'Grady when he was with Cork before they used to spend they could spend 20 25 minutes every night at training work just working on hooking and blocking just working on pressure 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 um uh, so I'm expecting a massive increase in you know their hook block tackle count this year and I'm expecting to see a lot more uh, as the as the boys would say intensity with, when they don't have the ball Do you know in general I don't necessarily know if good defensive work involves killing lads you know, the days of the shoulder where you plant someone and turn them upside down, they're a little bit gone in a way, aren't they? So Cork generally have really mobile teams who are very fast. So getting hooks and blocks in is more about that and availing of the fact that you're a really pacey team. So to me, there's no reason that they shouldn't really be able to do that. No, and that's why I thought even someone like Declan Dalton going in at the edge of the square last year, 
Uh, I think it was one of the goals he got came from, you know, a load of uh, harassing that was going on out the pitch. And he was really good at that. And he was really good, like an old style centre forward in soccer. He was really good at keeping the ball up there and keeping the pressure on. And I think they need they need to uh, they need to get that balance between having all these lovely like Shane. If we are picking uh, the best six forward in the country and we want them to go out and hurl a match in the morning, we're not going to pick out all guys that are going to shoot the lights out. We're going to pick, you're going to put, to me, uh, my example I would pick is uh, Burr won four club All-Irelands with, you know, some great forwards. But Liam Power from Burr, who never, very rarely, and he won't like me saying it, was very rarely on the score sheet, to me was their most important player. Because he was like a bonner. He was like a, a stopper. He was a, a re, he'd was he keep the ball there. He'd win frees for you. He'd get in big tackles. He'd get in big hooks and blocks. And I just think Cork need a player or two like that in the attack. They need to get that balance right. Yeah, you need a few pig ignorant lads up there as well. As we're talking about uh, Watford, there was a comment in on the YouTube uh, the other day when we did the Watford preview and it said, Shane, Michael, I've posted this question to you before and I'll do it again. Would you debate a partner for Jamie Barron in our midfield? Would you think Ozzy would be a good partner for him? He'd be able to get up and down, ball would be around him. He could destroy teams with his running through the middle while also getting back helping the defence like he did when he played as number six at underage for under 21 and minors. That's from Shane Power. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's an I think it's an interesting one. You want to use uh, the athleticism he has. Uh, he's obviously kept himself in good nick. You want to use that as much as you can. Uh, if he's coming off the shoulder at midfield, uh, if he's coming off the shoulder at midfield, he's going to be very very hard stop. We saw a couple of those scores he got with Mount Zion last year. Um, I think I think it's a possibility. I think there's also a possibility that Kevin Moore could end up back, back out in midfield again. I think. Um, not that he was exposed, but probably didn't have the best All Ireland final at wing back. And you're coming up against, you know, either Gerard Hegarty or Tom Morrissey. Well, it's a they tough might... job. Like when your team has been overwhelmed and then you have to chase somebody who can move like Gerard Hegarty, I think you're lambs to the slaughter. And most lads are, whether you're 30, 33 as he was then or whether you're 24, I think it's, it's a tough job. Just think there might be a bit more freedom for someone like that, maybe out around the, out around the middle of the pitch. He's obviously and fair play to him. He, he's gone in. I think it's in, into his 15th season at Waterford, and the easy thing would have been maybe to step back after after that, and maybe been a bit overawed in all Ireland finalists. Great to see a lad like that go going again. Could he, he go could f- be a potential option for Barron? Could he, he could be a potential him? option at wing forward as well, well. I was just going to say that because Brick Walsh was doing that at 35 6. Um, so why not Kevin Moore, who's played in wing forward not that many times for the county? But I, I think you could definitely have it where he's starting wing forward and then he's told to just go out around midfield and just impact the game. And there's some injuries this year as well. Like you're, you're after finding out that Dara Fives is injured, Stephen, Keefe, Stephen O'Keefe is away, Tyg de Borca is injured. Uh, Park Mahan is probably not ready yet as well. So they're they're going to have to juggle these pieces carefully. It's a tough job for Liam Cahill. But one point I'd make, just referring back to the, the question, comment that went in from Shane Power, is Neil, Go- Neil Montgomery and Daryl Lyons, the performances they had coming off the bench last year, I think they'd be in with a shout. They have a great ability to cover ground and they're well able to hurl and they're young players and they'll stay going all day. And I think it's no harm having that in the middle eight. Yeah, and I think I think Watford will believe as well going in this year. I think the likes of would say like Desi Hutchison, we, we t- you know you might think of like second season syndrome for Liam Cattell. How does he lift Watford again? It's also potentially a second season syndrome for the likes of Desi Hutchison, Jack Fagan. But they believe now that they can play at that level. That was their that was their first season at Intercounty. They know that that's in the bank. They know those big performances against Kilkenny are in the bank. Fair enough. The All Ireland final didn't go right for a lot of those guys. But it's in the bank. They know that they're they know that they're close. They know that they're knocking on the door. The big thing, like I think Billy Nolan will come in the goals for for Stephen O'Keefe. But the big question is who they put at put at number six. And me talking about Kevin Moore potentially moving up. Uh, maybe Shane Bennett will come back. He'll come back in. Will he come back in as a defender, which he was in his younger days, or will he will he be an attacking player? There, there's a lot of pieces that they're going to have to jig around there. But it's going to be interesting. Irla Dale is probably the most likely candidate for six if you have two, like probably, you know, Callum Lyons and, you know, A and Oder on the other side, two strong uh, wing backs beside him. He's probably the most likely to come in at six. But um, there's, I'd say there's a lot of optimism um, and a lot of kind of potential in Waterford. But again, they're back down at the very start this year and have to go and climb again. 
So it's going to be interesting to see what they can do. But they won't. There won't be any excuses from Liam Cattle. You can guarantee it. That there'll be no mention of the players that they're missing. He's a real old school manager in that respect he works on what he has in front of him and he will try to maximize that mm, and i wonder will will he be tempted to try shane bennett and desi hutchinson inside and maybe let ozzy gleason withdraw a little bit more and see how that works out and you know the likes of jack Prendergast. just the question the question the question shane power asked the thing about ozzy moving back midfield like he was their best player in the all Ireland final yeah at, at, at half forward and it kind of come into his own do we need do we need to move him back to midfield again? I'm I'm not so sure. Well, but maybe it's working. There, like yeah. that was his first season at full forward. Maybe it's beginning to work up there, and it was just going to take a little bit more time. And now, if he does have De- Desi Hutchinson, will say beside him, and Desi gets another year, and he continues his progression, and maybe then, you know, Kieran Bennett and Shane Bennett are, and Stephen Bennett are coming from deep, and they're able to just be that off the shoulder runner. And then uh, maybe they can interchange a little bit. There's a nice bit of flex- flexibility there too. And hopefully Park Mahoney hits the ground running eventually when he's right. Maybe things aren't looking so bad at all. Maybe not. Uh, DJ Foran is back involved as well. There's another big kind of a big paw man, yeah. on the, a half forward. Uh, Mikey Kiley is probably going to be an option now this year as well. Carney. So there's, there's plenty of options there. The, b- the big thing will be... Um, Sorting out the keeper and bedding in the keeper, which would probably be Billy Nolan and kind of bedding in a number six. As I said, they don't have that much time to do it, so it's going to have to happen fairly quickly. Yeah, so we'll move on to group or Division 1 Group B, Dublin versus Kilkenny. Kilkenny, of course, are in the mix for six this season, six years without an All-Ireland. Uh, as a, I mean, <laughs> You love that one. You <laughs> love that one. You'll, t- you'll continue that every year. Until until the until it's broken until they eventually climb the mountain again. I uh, this was a really good rivalry for a while. I think Kilkenny have started to get the whip hand in this once more, and you know Dublin kind of beat them one or two good games around. Jeez, it's eight or nine years ago that this was a really really top rivalry, and it's probably gone back a little bit more so because Dublin took a step back than anything else. Um, but it's important, I suppose, for both of these teams to get off to a good start. I suppose it is for everybody, but. Like Dublin, the way last year ended, fairly, I'd say, dispiriting circumstances against Cork in that game and Thurless, down by 12, eventually lost by 6, but it was just the manner of it. And the feeling that they hadn't really set the team up, probably in a way that I would see them having a best chance for victory, which is kind of flood the middle area, kind of flood the back area a little bit and hope to deliver good ball up to maybe... Trolley or Dylan or uh, Ronan Hayes on the inside and try and get joy that way. Have Danny Sutcliffe and Keen Boland as the runners off the shoulder supporting the attack. Maybe just kind of bolster that defence a little bit more and kick on again. And I would definitely feel they need to do that, become a combative team this year. And it's a good place to start against Kilkenny, bringing them up to Parnell Park where Dublin are very comfortable. Yeah, we had a viewer on to a Shane um, saying we talked a lot about the defence and we talked a lot about the attack but we didn't mention much about midfield and just dropping there for midfield a second, was yeah, an area that I, Dublin have really struggled in we didn't talk enough about the midfield yeah like like it's kind of been interchangeable there's been a lot it's been a movable feast that the names have changed a lot and they need to settle on a really strong midfield partnership probably with you know one really mobile player who's going to get up and down and another player who's going to maybe hold hold the line but it's probably changed the partnerships have probably changed far too much for their own good in recent years, and that's something they need to settle on as well. And like, is it looking like, from what we're hearing on the grapevine, that potentially Liam Rush could be back in defence because I think he's gotten a clean run at things this year. So that's an interesting one too. It's probably going to be if he's going to be back six, you'd imagine that Chris Crummy would be up the other end again. So it's going to be interesting to see how they how they kind of distribute their best players. I'm all for him. We said it in the season preview. I'm all for putting, you know, Crummy and these guys in their best positions. I'm not sure about playing guys out of position. Um, rush at rush at number six would be exciting if he's if he's fully fit and has had a really good preseason. He done a lot of his best hurling there. I still think he could be, you know, a really really good option at full forward where where Pat Gilroy used him and where he's probably been used in recent years, but with very little training under his belt. You see, he's only 30 years of age, so in the grand scheme of things, he's not that old. He's probably had a, so many injuries in the last three or four years. So the, he hasn't actually had that many miles in the clock, but it's just 
the, the older you get, as you start to get injured, they continue to come. I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate that feeling. They, just, they don't stop coming once you get a little bit older. But he is only 30 years of age. So if he can get a right good run at it, uh, if he could get back, like asking him to get back to 2013 form is a big ask. I mean, that's a long time ago at this stage. But he was brilliant at centre back there. He has a good aptitude for the position. He knows where to be. And obviously he played there after, the, after that year as well. It's not like he hasn't played centre-back for that long. But it's a big ask for him to get back to that form when he hasn't had, you know, like five challenge matches, when he hasn't had a Walsh Cup, all that type of thing. You're hitting the ground running against Kilkenny because they're going to test you out. But assuming that they, like, he's almost allowed to play as a sweeper if he plays there and if, if his body holds up, I think he could do that well because they need to be dropping extra men back uh, around the midfield, flood that area, and then if he can sort of attack the ball as a deep line centre back, maybe the way Ty de Borca does, and then maybe if Sean Moran is in the half back line, and I know Crummy may end up in the forward line, but I'd like to see him as the other wing back. Maybe Dara Gray will be that. And then the likes of, it's hard to know at midfield. You could see um, Reen McBride there, you could see Jake Malone there, you could see there's, there's probably a couple of other options that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head as well. But there are options there that Tomas Connolly is another guy who was very much in vogue two seasons ago, but not so much last year. There are options there, but the problem is they're just light on top level quality. I mentioned. Um, I meant to mention Fintan McGib when I was doing the preview the other day and I said Keen McGowan, I sometimes mix up some of the Irish names, but um, he's another lad that if he got back to his 2018 form, he's had so many injuries. Like, they, they could be a very competitive team, but um, yeah, I, I, do, I do have concerns about where they're going. Are they facing the difficulty as well, as with other teams trying to make the step up? Like how he doesn't, Matt again, he doesn't have that much time to find his best team. He doesn't have that much time to get into a rhythm, to find some sort of a balance in play and a style of play. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just, it is difficult um, when, you have a, when you have a lot of questions about who's playing where heading into the season. Whereas, you know, the teams at the higher tiers, probably the Galway, you can probably name 12 of the Galway team before you start and positions. Limerick, the same. Uh, Waterford, maybe not so much actually this year. But I just think it's it's going to be difficult to find a really, um, a really healthy balance for Dublin in such a short space of time. When there's just so many faces that seem to be moving around in, in different spots, particularly from, from eight upwards. So... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. This is a big, a big enough game for them. It's a big game for both this weekend, to be honest with you, because uh, optimism changes all of a sudden. You get a league win against Kilkenny under your belt, and you're not going facing the Limericks or the Tips in this group. You have a chance of winning three or four league games. Um, so this is a. I think it's a massive game. It's a big game for Kilkenny as well, but I think it's a particularly big game for Dublin. Get a result, and they'll feel like they're on the front foot for the season. Take a defeat at home all the games are getting more difficult from here onwards then. Yeah, and you were speaking with John Milan and he says it's bonkers that they're even considering getting rid of their greatest ever manager, probably the greatest manager we've ever come across in the GA. So th this talk of Brian Cody, and we've mentioned it as well in the Kilkenny preview that we did this week that people can check out. He, there's, it just isn't going to happen. I think he'd have to have a disastrous season where there's some heavy defeats before something like that would happen. They're coming in on the back of a Leinster Championship win last year, which was, to many people's mind, against the head. He's leaving whenever he wants to, not when other people decide. Yeah, but you, as well as, as much as me, you're well aware that that's a conversation that is happening amongst mm. Kilkenny people. You know, there's a, that is a genuine conversation. And there's a so does that more undermine the team and the players? Like, he's probably... I can't see him being forced out. So, But does this conversation undermine what he's doing and sort of hurt belief around... Does it maybe even seep into the panel that everyone outside is saying, Jesus, the, it's a bit prehistoric, some of what's going on here. You know, when they talk about the puckouts and stuff like that, that's a bit too route one. The players will hear that. And does that affect them in some way in how they prepare and how they believe what their manager is saying? Yeah, it can do. It can, it can work in both ways. It can work in the old style, you know, you know, put the newspaper article on the wall and say, this is, you know, everybody's writing us off. They're saying we're not this and we're not that. Uh, and it can, you know, galvanize lads. Or it can also potentially see, seep into your psyche and be like, you know, Limer you know, you've been involved with teams before where you're hearing what other teams are doing. And you're like, geez, I wish, I wish we were doing that. I hear they're doing X, Y, and Z. And we're 
doing you know you know dinosaur stuff and that's not to say that Kilkenny are doing that I'm just giving giving that as an example mm. um, and that can steep into your psyche and it's almost like you know there's a handicap against you you're almost working minus two or minus three before you even start because you feel you're not on an even keel with the teams that you're playing against or they're being better coached or they're being better looked after you know those things you've been in that position myself yourself as well so like that can, that can go one of two ways um but it just Looking at the age profile of a lot of the Kilkenny guys, they, they are calling on the, a lot of the elder statesmen. Killian Buckley uh, was back fit last year, had a good year, and actually had a good semi final against Waterford, even when things were going bad. Uh, Connor Fogarty is, is older. Richie Hogan, they're going to have to keep him fit. Uh, and TJ Reid, obviously, who's I think 34 later on this year, they're going to have to keep him fit as well. You're looking at those elder guys and the younger guys coming up haven't had the impact of, would say, a Richie Hogan, a TJ Reid, um, a Richie Power years ago. The Colin Fenley one is interesting as well, as well. Him not being involved, regardless of what the reasons are, or, you know, people will think, oh, looking at it from the outside anyway, you will, Colin Fenley's not involved. What's what's going on there? He's captain last year, taking a year out. Yeah, your He's audio's just there. dropped He's there for a second. Out of Hurling. You just yeah. dropped there for a second. But... Sorry, yeah, no, they're just... You, just saying about, about Colin Fenley not being involved as well, people will take a certain opinion about him not being involved in his early 30s as well and maybe read into that. Maybe there's nothing to read into. Maybe there is something to read into. But um, Just dropping again slightly you have a fair there. I'm just jumping on another point. That you, you mentioned Colin Fenley and him not being there. I wonder, a matchup I want to see this weekend is Owen O'Donnell against TJ Reid. Irrespective of where, you know, because we saw it in the 2018 Championship, that, that great game at Parnell Park and it was such a highlight. I'd love to see that reprise this weekend because if there's any man who's really good at shutting down a key player, it's Owen O'Donnell. And, you know, it's a t- as tough a task as any to shut down TJ Reid. But I want to see how does that impact this game if that matchup works for Dublin. Now, there was a different matchup in the Leinster Championship last year and Dublin had to change it. It went kind of very wrongly for them early in that game and they went well behind and obviously came back from 16 points down to, to be level. And I mean, this is something that Kilkenny did also against Watford, built up a very sizable lead and they were pegged back. So again, no, never mind our words seeping into the panel, is also this seeping into the panel and together... You know, is that affecting any belief? Maybe not, like, but it would be interesting. And I think Kilkenny need to see it as well. Let's say Owen O'Donnell goes on TJ Reid and he has an unbelievable game and does what very few do, which is shut him down. What else do Kilkenny have to offer, whether it's new players trial out or whatever it might be, or Adrian Mullen comes back into the ground running, whatever it might be. I almost think we, Kilkenny would be no harm for them to see what else they have. Yeah, you need to see where, where's the backup. Who's going to stand up? when the man that always stands up maybe is curbed somewhat. That's that's basically it, isn't it? Mm, yeah, without doubt. So we'll move on to uh, Antrim against Clare. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by torpy.ie. And if you want to get the new bamboo hurley, which is absolutely brilliant, go onto the website and put in the promo code our game and you get 10% off. But Antrim against Clare this weekend. Um, I was reading an article um, on the Irish News. Oli Baker, who was, who's obviously a Clare man, and he was a selector with Antrim under Dinny Cahill, I think around 2011. He was saying Antrim, and I think this is a general point, Antrim should feel confident. They're going, in, going to treat this like a championship game where Clare are preparing for a championship. So those two different mindsets mean Antrim should be relishing this opportunity against the big boys. Now, they're bringing them up to Corrigan Park, so it's going to be a fair old trek for those Clare players for a 1pm throw-in. But, um, w- like, Darren Gleeson has obviously done pretty well because they won the Joe McDonough Cup last year. They'll, f- they'll probably feel like they're on that upward curve, came first in Division 2A last year. Neil McManus, who had a hamstring injury last year and was used as a sub in the McDonough Cup, finally obviously wasn't right to start. He'll, he'll probably be back now as well. So it probably feels like everything's going well for Antrim. Yeah, I always love how I was going through the fixtures for Down as well and the games in Ballycran and these up in Corrigan Park, how they managed to be at one o'clock. I, it always amazes me that you have to travel further and yet the games are played earlier. But uh, Antrim had a really good year last year. They beat Kerry in the McDonough final by a couple of points and they beat them in the Division 2A final. Uh, they deserve to be up in the top division now. Uh, in fairness to Darren Gleeson, was involved as a coach for a year, came in as manager last year. I think Neil Peden has done massive work uh, behind the scenes as well in the development of Antrim. There seems to be uh, a very good buzz up there. I know from chatting to Darren a couple of times, he absolutely loves going up there. 
says they're absolutely fanatical about it and he's after getting a massive buy-in and has demanded a buy-in from the lads that are there. And I think crucially, as you said there, we're not just talking about Neil McManus now. We're talking about Conor McCann. We're talking about Keelan Malloy in midfield. Lovely left, left-handed left hurler. There's there's lots of names outside of those bigger bigger names that we would have maybe just relied on. You know, always, you look at the paper every every Monday morning and you see Neil McManus one ten nine freeze or whatever it is. Whereas last year, he was probably mostly due to injury, but he was only a bit part player. And I think that's huge in their development. No more than any other team, no more than Kilkenny's development... Like they need to have other players chipping in outside of TJ Reid. They need to be able to rely on other players in his absence. And it's good that Antrim have got to that level now where they don't necessarily need their marquee names to be even there on a given day and let alone shining on that day. So fair juice to Darren Gleeson. It's a fair um it's a fair spin from Port Row up to up to Corrigan Park and all these all these places. So it's that shows you how committed he is to the cause anyway. And he's kind of cutting out a nice niche for himself there. Um he'll obviously want to get back to tip at some stage. And having worked under under Sheedy even up there for a year now, he's manager now. And yeah, they'll like what's what's progress for them this year? Staying in division one is definitely uh, progress for them and the, the group that they're in potentially you know if they beat Leash they're probably not even going to be in a relegation playoff so staying up in Division 1 is crucial for them this year and they'll feel that they can based on everything they showed last year Yeah they were they impressed me at times during that that league final or that Joe McDonough final against Kerry finished 22 points to 117 but and they had probably didn't get flowing until later in the game which I think is something that that uh, Darren Gleeson himself had said and he, he said after the game I was delighted that we dogged it out I actually got great satisfaction out of that which kind of suggests I suppose that reflects the type of team that he's trying to build that it's not just a fancy little hurling team that it's a team that's going to be able for a rough day of it which you're going to get plenty of that in the in the Liam McCarthy level because the teams are so physically big and strong so that's something that I, I think when I was looking at the shape of them in that McDonough final last year, I was thinking they do look like they're a small step ahead of Kerry here. And like you have people who can cover the ground like Keel and Loy and Niall McKenna, who I thought was brilliant in that final. Conal Cunning couldn't even get into the starting team as well. And Neil McManus came on also. So that suggests that there's a great balance and strength to that squad. So I think they're, they're probably in, a, in good shape coming into this season. Whereas Clare at the other side of the big question, Shane. The big question though, Shane, about Antrim is how steep is this step up for them? And I know Don Lowe kind of commented that he thinks they'd be lambs to the slaughter at this level. And, uh, you know, the timing of it was, was quite poor the, the evening after winning the Joe McDonough. But it, it, is a, it is a steep learning curve. And they're going to have to, you know, produce a couple of big results. He, he had kind of said that if they take a couple of big beatings, it'll put them, you know, put them back a good bit. Like, what do, what do you think yourself? How steep do you think that rise will be? And do you think that they can take the rise in their stride? Well... You know, Leash have come in and and Carlo in in recent years. Like they they've had some tough days too. Those teams. I mean, Leash were beaten comprehensively last year by Dublin, for example. But Antrim, they'll probably feel like they're in as good a position as any of the teams that have come up in the last couple of years to compete. Now they they've got a couple of games that are more winnable than, for example, we've mentioned with Westmead in the other side of the league. So on their side, Antrim have got Leash, Dublin, Kilkenny, Wexford, and Start with Clare. There's probably going to be a heavy defeat or two in there somewhere. But on that side of the draw, it is far more winnable than games against Limerick, Waterford, Galway, Tip, Cork. I think they've got a better chance to acclimatise to this level. But it's it's not going to come without some tough days either. Lambs to the slaughter, that could prove to be right. You just don't know. Like If they end up getting a couple of injuries, all of a sudden, maybe things are looking a little bit light. You get in bad form and maybe it becomes very difficult. But I, I think there's no reason to feel that they can't sort of start moving in this direction. But normally these things come with tough defeats. Then you move on to the championship and they're going to have Dublin in the first round. And you know, it's, it's 10 years ago when they had, or is it 11 years ago, they had that famous win over Dublin in the championship. So again, I don't think Dublin are a team that they would necessarily fear if they came up against Kilkenny in the first round of the championship or Galway or, or Wexford. Now Dublin can compete with all those teams, but whatever it is about it, Dublin aren't a team that are probably going to put 30, 35 points in you the way those other teams are. So I, th- I think there's a chance of progress this year, a chance of winning anything. You know, it's, That's not going to happen at those top tiers. But building, yeah, I, th- I can see that happening. 
Yeah, and I definitely think there's a chance of progress and like realistically, like the only way you're gonna find out is to go up and test your metal mm. against these sides. Will they take a couple of defeats? Of course they will. But as you say, that championship game against Dublin, they will see that as a, a as an opportunity. They will definitely see that as an opportunity. Not facing with maybe, you know, a Wexford or a or a, a Kilkenny or a Galway. I think they'll see that as an opportunity and I think that'll be in their back of the minds. They'll want to secure division one status and then all eyes will so what about Clare for this season? I mean, last year, all anyone was talking about was Cahar Lohan, the county board, finances, this type of thing. But even so, Brian Lohan had a decent season. They, I suppose, lost by nine points to Limerick in the championship, but they probably got as close as, as most did. Tony Kelly had a fantastic season. They had a great win over Wexford. Uh, ultimately lost comfortably to Waterford, but we're in the game for long spells, and Tony Kelly's injury probably played a part in that too. But I, I would have some people who say to me, it's not necessarily my belief, that Clare, once Tony Kelly exits the stage or starts to slow down in three or four years' time, once John Conlon, maybe he packs it in and one or two more start to get a little bit older, that there aren't really underage players coming through. They haven't been winning games at all, really, underage, that they're going to start looking towards relegations in the league and maybe even, I mean, Joe McDonough. Do you see that as being their future? Uh, when you said it to me first, I was trying to digest it, and I was thinking, like it's that's surely very unlikely. And then I'm thinking, uh, I was probably thinking in the back of my head the same thing about Offaly four or five years ago. So if this is people with an intimate knowledge of Clare Hurling who know what's coming through and what's not coming through, and whether these massive uh, holes that will need to be plugged by the absence of Tony Kelly and John Conlon over the coming years, if they, if these people that are seeing all these underage games and seeing maybe uh, what they might perceive as the lack of talent coming through, then I'd, I'd, I definitely would respect that opinion. Uh, it, it, looks a, it looks a long way away at the moment, but it, as I saw in my own county, it doesn't take that long for the, for the wheels to come off. They mm. still have lots of talent at senior level now. And I think in fairness, I would say Brian, Brian Lowen nearly overachieved last year. We, I was expecting Limerick to win uh, and keep Clare at you know at at a distance, but not for Clare to be as competitive as they were basically until until the final quarter when Limerick probably pulled away. So, yeah, no, I I, I think the standard the standard has probably dropped in the panel a small bit, and the strength and depth of the squad maybe isn't what it was like in twenty eighteen. But as you say, John Conlon's going to be back fit this year. Uh, I saw, as I said, referred to that picture earlier. Him and Colm Galvin and a couple of others were running on a track somewhere down in down in Clare. So they must be they must be fit enough. Galvin back Galvin back on board is huge as well. He's a, a brilliant foil for Tony Kelly. Like imagine to say if Colm Galvin got back, there's a potential that Tony Kelly could get could get even better. And Galvin plays that defensive role really well. That deep sitting midfielder, almost like almost like a sweeper, almost or an orthodox kind of centre back. Um, but there's still no there's still no Peter Duggan. Shane Amori's opted out for the year as well. So they are a bit short on options. There's definitely not the squad depth of others. But when you put some of their top players up against the top players in other counties, they, they would come out favourably. But just lacking lacking that strength and depth. They're going to need some some a lot more from David McInerney as well. He was captain last year. And I would say, I, I don't know if they got enough out of him at different stages. He was midfield. Maybe they need to you know put him, put him back centre-back. And, and work from there. Not sure. Again, we're we're probably unsure of who's going to be three and six kind of going into this this kind of league. But we'll we'll find out fairly quick. And I think the fact that they're in this second group, they were brilliant in the league last year. You know, mm-hmm. they uh, they ended up in the league final, albeit it was that monster quarter final. So like they'll be aiming for a very very strong league again. I don't see that slip off that you're talking about happening for a couple of years. But I definitely would respect uh, would respect the opinion of those clear, clear people that think that potentially might happen. So Wexford are playing against Leash this weekend, and um, Davy against Cheddar. Really, Cheddar has a tough tough job this season. Just looking at some of the players that are injured, like Mark Cavanagh is out, Ronan Broderick's out, Eric Killeen, they're all gone for the year. Willie Dunphy and Peaky Maher, they're both gone as well. They've had operations. John Lennon isn't right there. Um, I think Ian Lyons isn't right either. They do have Chad Dwyer back, PJ Scully and Kieran Collier is back as well. So they do have some lads in, but they were a bit away from it last year and I know they pushed 
they pushed Clare very strongly in that um, in that qualifier, but then again, Clare were down to 14 men for the entirety of the second half. Now, there was definitely positive signs in that game, but a tumultuous off-season. Cheddar was the right man to come in, I think, because most of the players wanted him. But it, I, it's with all of those injuries, it's going to be tough to see how they can kick on this year. Yeah, you can have probably the best setup in the world, and he has a very good setup there. But I think Franny Ford is involved in the background there as well. He was involved with Galway before. But like, if you're missing like those players, and like to be honest, when, I, when we jumped on the call, it was only news to me that some of those guys were going to be missing because you'd obviously been chatting to, to Jack Nolan uh, for the leash preview. But they're big names like Willie Dunphy, Picky Mar, John Lennon, Mark Kavanagh. They're like four of their best players from that 2019 run. And even at different stages last year as well, so like it is, it is a bit of an up, it is a bit of an uphill climb. You have to say, you know, fair. Cheddar was the the man that the players wanted to come back, and fair play to him for answering the call because, um, it didn't look it not that it didn't look like it was going to end well, but it looked like they could be in a sticky position and could end up going back to I suppose pre Cheddar times when they were really really struggling and shipped. It was, it was that seven goals, was there a nine goals against Cork and a ten goals, sorry, actually. Ten goals, I, I, yeah, I, got, I got there the third time. Ten goals, they conceded against Cork in that qualifier that time. You know, and they were really, really lean times. Be interesting to see, John Lennon being gone, would you think would maybe, you know, take away one of those sweeper options? I know Cheddar has often played with the sweeper. So be interesting to see what way he plays. Will they try and play a game of containment? Or will they go 15 on 15? I find it hard to see them going 15 on 15. And I'd imagine the sweeper will probably be in operation as well from the start. Mm, and are Wexford going to do much different this year? I mean, we did a, a Wexford preview during the week. I can see them just t- trying to get everyone fit this time, having Lee Chin hitting the ground running and going back to what worked in 2019. Last year, maybe they were just overcooked. Maybe that was it. Because, But I had one Wexford man co- contact me this week after we did the preview and I think in general, you know, we were looking at the fact that they did have a down season and, you know, it started out well under Davy, then they took a little back step the next year, then they came back and won Leinster. Last year, they lost their, combined, their two games by a combined 20 points in the championship, so obviously that was very disappointing. But in general, I think we were kind of pretty optimistic and it was the first Leinster title in 15 years. They pushed Tipperary hard in the semi-final. But then I had a Wexford man contact me after the preview and he said, well, actually, if you think about it, in the last two years, Wexford have won only two championship games, and one of those was against Carlo, who they'd expect to beat, and the other was the Leinster final. They'd obviously drawn some games to otherwise get into that Leinster final. So when you look at it that way, two championship wins in the past two seasons, that's not overly impressive. No, it's a fair, it's a fair point uh, when you look at the when you look at the stats of it. It is it is a fair point. They obviously won the Leinster championship that year, only winning one game in in the group stages. And drawn, drawn the other three. So you know, it's it's a it's a fair point. Um, D. O'Keefe uh, was on earlier on this week, just kind of saying that their Leinster run last year, or you know, trying to defend the Leinster title, was as tame an effort to retain a Leinster title as probably anyone has come out with. We just didn't perform at all. It was flat. They were stale performances. You were really trying to get back into the mindset of challenging yourself, uh, like 2019 again, and trying to lift yourself a little bit more and to try and dig in that way. He said, on a personal level, you want to forget your performances. They were so below par. I expect, expect so much more from myself, and I know the lads do as well as a team, to try and rise above that and come, a good, then, come good again this year. So there will like, there should be no shortage of motivation this year, particularly in Davies' fifth and final year. But as you say, everything needs to be on point, I think, with Wexford, and particularly the energy levels with the game that they play need to be on point. Uh, I, I'd expect them to to get over leash at the, at the weekend, but it's kind of going forward. I think they're one of the teams that would benefit from being in 1B as well and maybe not having, like as I said to you, if you're in 1A, you kind of have to go flat out from the start because mm. you can't risk shipping that big, a big kind of morale sap and win. Whereas in 1B, like even on their worst day, I wouldn't say they're going to ship a big defeat in, in 1B um, at, this sta- at this stage of the year. So they can kind of get things right for the championship coming from 1B. Um, but I'd imagine they will be at a decent level from the start. Just interesting, as I said to you in the preview, just I'm intrigued to see whether there will be any positional changes, whether we will see maybe 
I said it to you, like potentially Lee Ching going back centre back or something like that. Just interesting to see if they're going to mix things up. I know you think they'll probably stick with what was successful for them in 2019 or try and get back to those similar levels. I'm just just intrigued by that. Again, when we talk about panels, not blessed with you know the strongest panel. Generally, when we were seeing players coming in in games, it was uh, your Aidan Nolans, your David Dunns, your Harry Kyo's. It was usually the same names. Mm. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if Richie Lawler, P, uh, Ross Banville, a couple of others are kind of thrown into the mix in the league and given a really, really good go at it because they do need to unearth a few more, especially with Paddy Foley gone. There's plenty of games in Division 2A and 2B as well. Kerry against Down. You're going to Mead against Offaly and Carlow against Wicklow, as we kind of mentioned at the top of the show. But Mead against Offaly. I wonder if you look on the screen there, is there any players we're going to see from uh, Offaly this weekend lining out that haven't lined out in a few years? Huh? That's Dottie Regan with my face on him, I think, back <laughs> from a picture from the 90s. Yeah. Um, you look well in that old school jersey. Yeah, I actually like that one, the old kind of cotton material. Remember when, do you remember, like, actually, when long sleeve jerseys were a thing? I mean, it's, it's I remember like, when it rained it, and you had them Yeah. Off. They just seem like it seems like uh, it seems like such an alien concept. Long sleeve jerseys and the old towel gripping. It's probably like things that we'll never see again, maybe in the in the GA. And still the long sleeve jersey is still a blessing when it comes to the winter trend, I can tell you that. Uh Mead Offley's Mead Offley is not the most glamorous tie of the weekend and anything other than a win for, for Offley, um probably going to see you know chances of getting out of two A gone because they're facing up against the likes of Kerry and Carlo later on so they have to beat Mead and you know Mead have been operating at a at a higher level than Offaly uh, in the la- in the last couple of years Offaly would have beaten them in the league last year but Mead are well, obviously operating at Joe McDonough level so that's a that's a tricky one Kerry and Down is another interesting one too Kerry were beaten in the two major finals they played in last year the Joe McDonough and the Division 2A final is Fintan O'Connor's fifth year they'll be absolutely mad to, to get back, to get up uh, to get up to Division One, like th- that, would be huge progress for Kerry to be playing Division One hurling in 2022. Down on the other side, then were runners up in the Christie Ring last year, and you have the unique scenario where Down are playing two A league hurling, having been runners up in the Christie Ring. Kildare are playing two B hurling, having won the Christie Ring. The league can kind of throw off up kind of scenarios like that, and the other two A game then is, is Carlo against Wicklow. Uh, Tom Malady's first year. With, with Carlo, interesting to see what he brings there. Would have been involved with a couple of county setups before and would have been heavily involved at club level and would have had a lot of success at club level. Yeah, so Mount Leinster and he was with uh, Clara as well. Yeah, he's big shoes to fill. Um, Bonner, Bonner had great success there. Maybe last year might have been a year too many, but it'd uh, be interesting to see what they offer. Eamon Scallon's in his third year then with Wicklow. They've had a couple of... Elder Statesman leave, uh, Billy Cuddy and uh, Stephen, I actually can't think of his second name, it's Chester I, is, all, is all I know him as. Uh, they're both gone, two, uh, two Greystones players, they're both gone, so they're probably going with a bit more youth this year. But two is interesting enough, but anything other than promotion for Kerry would be a disappointment. But it's very difficult when you throw in Carlo into the mix as well, played Division 1 hurling last year, and then awfully trying, trying to get back up to Division 1 again. For Michael Fenley this year, Division, getting up and playing Division One hurling next year is huge. Christy Ring should be winning the Christy Ring should be a given, uh, just with the opposition that they're going to be playing and the fact that Down and Kildare last year's finals are both up. So going to be interesting there. Two B is interesting too. Key Higgins back playing, back playing hurling for Mayo and already made captain. Like that just shows you, that just shows you like um, you know his status as a hurler within the county. He's on real fair play to him because the easy thing would have been just to step aside or whatever but he just absolutely loves it clearly yeah and like can you imagine his excitement now because it would have been tough last year sitting on the bench for the footballers for the most part now he's going to go in and he's absolutely central too it'd probably give him a new le- lease of life as well i'd so, imagine he'd enjoy it a lot more yeah. too shane there's a lot like like don't get me wrong there's pressure but I, I'd say he does. I'd say it was always a release for him, and I'd say he loves going back now. They're playing. They're opening with a tough enough uh, game against Derry. Then you have Donegal and Ross Common in the other two. Donegal obviously won the record last year, but weren't promoted. And Kildare are off this weekend, and there's no Division Three A or Three B hurling this weekend. So it's just just Division One and Division Two to focus on this weekend. But Jesus, um, it's the isn't it great? The, the amount of you literally would need 
televisions and screens every side of you this weekend to keep on track with everything that's going on. You would, you would, your own little uh, at home uh, betting office type of a setup. Exactly. Uh, so, right, so that's it, the hurling for this weekend. And um, look, we'll be reviewing it again next week. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off.